introduce myself, my name is Jane Richter and I'd like to share a few of my travel tales with you. Let me first explain how I came to be in Calcutta. In 1947, the year of Indian independence, my Aunt Edna started working in the library of the High Commission of India in London, India House. It's located at the Aldwych, directly opposite the Waldorf Hotel. Many well-known faces visited India House back then. Even royalty visited occasionally, but she was even more excited about meeting Nehru, India's first Prime Minister, who she saw several times. Before Edna died, I made contact with her old colleague Maureen Travis. Maureen was head librarian, and incredibly, she was still working, 68 years on, age 91. She invited my son and me to visit her in India House. What an experience that was. Indeed, it proved to be the inspiration for our first visit to India. Neither Maureen nor Edna had ever been. I had just moved to Freshwater on the Isle of Wight, close to Farringford and Dimbala, numbers three and four on the map. I had also just started up my tour guiding company, Isle of Wight Guided Tours. Dimbala is the house where Victorian pioneer portrait photographer Julia Margaret Cameron lived and worked from 1860 to 1875. She moved next door to Farringford, the house of her good friend Alfred Lord Tennyson, poet laureate to Queen Victoria. He lived here with his family for around 40 years. I became an instant admirer of Julia's work and environment and have subsequently become involved with the museum and galleries. It was during my second Indian trip that I first visited Kolkata. I had been invited by my friend Rutna Bagchi to stay with her. It was then that I decided to combine my personal exploration with searching for signs of Julia. Rutna recommended Longing Belonging, an outsider at home in Calcutta, one of Bishwanath Ghosh's books of quirky and insightful journalistic musings on various Indian cities. To cut a long story short, Bishwanath and his wife Shuvushri are now good friends of mine. He sums Calcutta up as a delightful salad of the colonial and the Bengali with a dash of the global. But here we are at St John's, where our story begins. St John's Church, or Anglican Cathedral as it was then, is our first and a recurring link to Julia. Modelled on London's St Martin's in the Fields, it was one of the earliest buildings erected by the British East India Company. It was built of brick and stone, a new idea in Calcutta at the time, and is the third oldest church in the city. St John's is significant in Julia's story. She was baptised here on August the 29th, 1815, aged two months, and married husband Charles here at the age of 23. Why don't I introduce her parents first? Her father, James Paddle, was a British government official living at 39 Garden Reach Road. His French wife, born Adeline Marie de Letton, gave birth to Julia Margaret on June the 11th, 1815. The pencil portraits of the Patel and Dilettante families are recreated by US descendant and artist Deborah Spooner. She has lovingly updated many of G.F. Watts and other artists' portraits. These recreations include restoring and colorizing original artwork and photographs both Julia's father, James, and his French aristocratic wife, Adeline, were born in India. James steadily climbed the East India Company ladder. Here, its headquarters, East India House in Leadenhall Street, London. Hailing from a long line of East India Company officials, he aimed high and worked hard. He was rewarded by becoming a Calcutta High Court judge. In late 1817, Julia was taken to France with her sisters by their mother and grandmother. She arrived not long after her third birthday and wouldn't return to live in Calcutta until she was 19. This was perfectly normal for British and French Indian residents. Julia was in Europe from 1818 to 1834. Her education was split between Paris, Versailles and London. On your right, the beautiful Versailles townhouse, which Therese had inherited from her father-in-law, both as it was and as it looks now. 
She spent a lot of time here when she was older, particularly after Ambroise's death in 1840, but also during her grandchildren's school years. Coincidentally, the house was just a stone's throw from the palace where Ambroise had started work at the tender age of 12. The Bengal Club was founded in 1827 and started life as the world's third oldest British club. In no way is it open to the public. However, I had been introduced by members. Inside, it's truly like being transported back to a bygone age. Jim Paddle and all his male friends and family were also members. They would have walked the same corridors and admired the same decor that I did. And the next coincidence, not only was James a member, but he was actually its chairman for a time. It's situated on the exact spot where the home of politician and historian Thomas Babington Macaulay, author of A History of England, once stood. Mother and daughter Nita and Sanjita Matumdar were fellow guests. Ex-Calcuttans now living in Delhi, here they are in the Oxford bookstore on Park Street, having just bought a copy of Bishwanath's first book, Chai Chai. Each morning we would chat away over a leisurely breakfast. They included me in their family activities, sisters, aunts, cousins, wonderful. On a couple of occasions, I joined them for drinks and snacks in the bar. One evening, we planned a special outing. We took a taxi and drove to Charnock's ancient village of Sutanuti, accompanied by Bishwanath. We then took a boat ride, recreating a journey that he describes in Longing Belonging. The views of the romantically illuminated Howrah Bridge made a lasting impression watching the vivid reflections of the electric colours dance on the dark surface of the sacred river below were spellbinding. But back to Julia. She met William Makepeace Thackeray at a social gathering whilst holidaying in Europe. He was actually a friend of the whole Paddle clan and had been born in Calcutta four years before her. Their friendship was to resume years later when he introduced her to his daughters in London. Annie was a writer like her father, and she and Julia got on well. When Thackeray died suddenly on Christmas Eve 1863, Julia took her and her sister Minnie back to Dimbala with her. She offered them both a home for as long as they wanted. She also took these lovely photographs of them. So for me, it was a real bonus when one evening, out of the blue, Bishwanad and Chuvushri pointed out the house where Thackeray was born. After Julia came back from Europe aged 19, the Paddle sisters became much admired on Calcutta's social circuit, the more so as eligible young ladies were in quite short supply at the time. But within two years, she was ailing with a respiratory complaint, requiring her to convalesce at the Cape of Good Hope. This wasn't at all unusual for the European Indian community. There she met Charles Hay Cameron, who she married two years later. He was there recovering from the effects of overwork. Safely back in Calcutta, their wedding took place in the now familiar St John's on February the 1st, 1838. But a quick personal recap here. I had seen Thackeray's birthplace, at least what was left of it, and Macaulay, Charles Cameron's colleague and predecessor, I had virtually stayed in his house, in a club where James Paddle was once chairman and moreover lived and died two doors away. It seems that I really was walking in Julia's footsteps, even if I was unaware of it at the time. And that's even before I inadvertently stumbled upon yet another relative of hers. But that's jumping the gun. Her father, James Paddle, had one of the longest serving records within the East India Company, maybe even the longest. His roles were in the fields of both revenue and judiciary. He died in his Choringi home in September 1845, probably due to a weak heart. In his will, he left money for a simple burial without specifying where but it was known that he wanted it to be in England, next to his mother in St Giles Church, Camberwell.
This seemingly took place on March the 16th, 1846. Adeline was accompanied on the journey by other family members. She died at sea in November, just two months after her husband. After a long illness, this proved to be her final and most tragic voyage. She died three weeks before their P&O steamer, the Precursor, docked in Suez on December the 4th, 1845. Hers was a sea burial. Once in London, her two youngest daughters headed for the home of Sister Sarah and family to live with them. The Camerons left Calcutta permanently in 1848. For them, it was a fond farewell, then off to start a new chapter in England. Charles was not a well man. Still only 53, he never actually worked again. This is a present day view across Cameron's land, Sri Lanka. Charles was confident that he would manage to live off the income from his coffee plantations. He did, but only just. It didn't prove as easy as he had imagined. In London, Julia was reunited with her older children, plus sisters Sarah, Virginia, Sophia, Louisa and Mia, who were all now established there. They were joined by new additions to the family. These arrived in the form of fourth and fifth sons, Charles and Henry, born after the move. It was at Little Holland House, the home of society hostess Sarah and husband Toby, that she met many of the artists, writers and intellectuals who would become so important to her. While all sitting together in the Bengal Club Library, new friends Nita and Sanjita regaled me with tales of two of Calcutta's feminist icons of the non-human kind. They are two Hindu goddesses, Kali and Durga, both with associated festivals or pujas. Julia would certainly have been familiar with them. They are both avatars of the goddess Parvati and consorts of Shiva. Shiva is the destroyer of evil and, as Bishwanad imaginatively calls him, the rock star god. Both Durga and Kali symbolize feminine power and fight evil. Kali in particular is associated with darkness and destruction. Her temple in Kaligat, in the oldest part of the city, has existed since before Charnak's arrival. The goddess is 3,000 years old and lent her name to Calcutta's original name, Kali Kata. Durga is often referred to as Ma Durga, a mother figure, even though a demon slayer. She has four children, one of them being the popular elephant-headed Ganesha, god of wisdom, success and good luck. In each of her ten, sometimes eight, hands, she brandishes a different weapon. They were gifts from other deities, one from each, to help her in her mission. Kali always wears a necklace of skulls and has her long tongue sticking out and her husband lying at her feet. Turga Puja is Calcutta's largest festival and as cultural as it is religious. It celebrates her victory over the demon king. The idol makers are all located in a specific area of the city named Kumar Tuli or Potter's Alley. They are more than happy to be watched at their work and take great pride in practicing their time-honored craft. The idols themselves, made of mud and straw, are beautiful artistic creations. This makes their ultimate fate slightly puzzling, particularly to an outsider. At the end of the festivities, they are totally immersed in the Hooghly River. These idols have been left on the riverbank in readiness for the immersion ceremony. The Hooghly is the very lifeblood of a Calcutta. It's a tributary of the River Ganges. Ma Ganges, as it's also known, is itself considered to be a goddess in liquid form and is India's holiest river. The idol immersion used to take place as soon as the festivities ended, but now the best ones are paraded through the streets for a grand finale. Shivushri Choudhury, seen here with actor Victor Banerjee, will now read you an extract on the theme of Durga Puja from her Across Borders. Ranjit Uncle is her own great uncle, R.P. Shah, a well-known philanthropist in what was then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. 
He was the founder of Kumudini Welfare Trust. Maya, the narrator, is Shuvushri's mother. She is reminiscing about her time at Ranjit's boarding school in Dhaka, just before the 1964 riots. Ranjit uncle celebrated Durga Puja fervently and lavishly. As he was in reality celebrating womanhood, the source of life, perhaps in memory of his own mother who had died at childbirth. He lived his life trying to fulfill his dream of the emancipation of women, especially rural women starting at home, with his family. This forward thinking by a male was remarkable, considering the position of women then, especially in rural India and Pakistan. I was to never forget his lessons on the equality of women without her needing to act like a man to prove it. Not only did I live my life by these doc doctrines, I would also bring up my two daughters to think of themselves no less than any son I might have ever had. One day, by my own initiation, my daughter would light her father's funeral pyre at a public crematorium. I would not permit my son-in-law to do so, merely for being born male, while my daughters and I stayed home. Every year at Durga Puja, the new idol was worshipped wearing Madhurga's personal set of real gold jewelry. She and her children were adorned in them on Shoshti, the first day of the Puja. These were removed and safely put away in a trunk before the immersion on Dashami, the last of the five-day Puja, to be used the following year. Ma Durga was draped in a new red Benarasi sari every year, which was then given to any woman in the family who was getting married the following year to wear at her wedding. The new bride wore Ma Durga's sari like a daughter would wear her mother's on her wedding day. This was in order to invoke the revered mother's blessings to bestow on her strength and good luck. Ronji Tankal had immense faith in the strength of Ma Durga. He wished upon every woman to find that same strength and power within herself with the belief that all women have an inherent potency, especially in times of crisis. This was the axiom by which I would lead my life. For it was for us, it was not merely the celebration of Durga Puja and womanhood, but of religious harmony during religious turbulent times. We did not think of the puja only on religious lines, but as a coming together of all religions and cultures. Many Muslims and Christians, both students and teachers of the school, as well as guests, attended the celebrations, even if they did not take part in the prayers and rituals. Everyone who attended was served a meal, which had been consecrated as an offering to the goddess. Though they were special cooks, to prepare the meals on all five days, we students served. It was a fulfilling experience as we participated wholeheartedly in the festival. It brought everyone together and was an opportunity to connect. The University of Calcutta, established thanks to the work of Charles Cameron, is located in College Street, along with Sanskrit College and other prestigious institutions. But I now invite you to listen to Bishwanad's words rather than mine. As this reading is not recorded, you won't actually hear his voice, although you will see him. Sadly, it needed to be a condensed extract from Longing Belonging. In this part, the iconic Indian coffee house finds itself in the spotlight. And yes, it's true, regulars do tend to disregard the no smoking signs. I quote, On one side of College Street are the temples of learning, Calcutta Medical College, India's oldest, University of Calcutta, Presidency College, etc. On the other side, where the entire pavement is occupied by booksellers, stands Coffee House. Coffee House, too, is an institution by itself. It's situated on the first floor of a historic building called Albert Hall. If not for the signboard of Coffee House, the building would go unnoticed, eclipsed by the shops selling textbooks. On the landing, the aged walls have political posters pasted on them. They have been put up by students' unions belonging to various ideologies. Young men and women just into college like to linger here because they pay next to nothing for killing time in the hallowed premises. 
The place is noisier than a college canteen. Coffee House is a museum of memories. The curators are the waiters who still wear Raj era white uniforms, which include a cummerbund and turban. Coffee House gives its patrons the freedom to smoke, thereby insisting on preserving its old self. The Albert Hall building was founded in 1876. In 1942, when the coffee board was set up by the government, Coffee House was started here to promote coffee. Until then, coffee was not very popular among Indians. It was considered the drink of the Saibs. Coffee House earned its reputation as the meeting point of Calcutta's intelligentsia during the tumultuous 1960s and 70s, when the vacuum created by the departure of the British was filled by homegrown anger and creativity. Inside is a larger-than-life portrait of a young Tagore wearing a black beard, looming over the tables in the high-ceilinged hall. End quote. Rabindranath Tagore is India's best-known and best-loved poet, but also writer of stories, plays and songs. He was also a painter later in life. In the West, he's probably best known as being the first non-European recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913. But he was also an educationalist, philosopher, social reformer and a prolific traveller. He exchanged ideas with most of the world's greatest thinkers, artists and leaders, photographed here with Albert Einstein. Naturally, his discussion partners included homegrown movers and shakers such as Gandhi. Though not always in agreement, they valued each other highly. The little village that grew up where Father de Bendelnad had purchased land and started an ashram is called Shantiniketan, meaning abode of peace. I have been here several times now. The village has continued to expand around Tagore's campus. Based on Bengali free-thinking ideology, the area is also known as Tagore land, this rightly so, as his presence here is still tangible. Students, makers of arts and crafts, farmers and intellectuals all live side by side. Still an abode of peace, it has retained the air of spirituality first recognised by Dibendranath Tagore. I stay with a lovely couple, Krishna and Shukanya Dei, who are now good friends. They run an idyllic homestay called Mitali, which means friendship. It is simply one of the loveliest places I have ever been. I have never been anywhere that offers greater tranquility, prettier surroundings, better companionship or more wonderful food. But back to Julia for the last time. In 1860, she and Charles moved to Freshwater Bay, Isle of Wight. This move away from London was one of her spontaneous decisions. The iconic rocks known as the Needles are close by. Here, an unusual sketch from 1856. The base of the present lighthouse, then newly under construction, is just visible. When Julia moved in, it had only been recently completed. Because of Tennyson, Julia bought two cottages next to his Farringford. She later joined them together, naming the property Dimbala Lodge. But he was by no means the only celebrity living on the Isle of Wight. In 1845, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had bought Osborne, demolishing the original house. By the time the Camerons docked in London, the main rebuild was halfway through. Julia had retained her interest in photography. So when she was 48, after three years of island life, her daughter and son-in-law bought her a box camera. But this was later upgraded to something bigger and better. Her total obsession went way beyond mere amusement. She chose to use the wet collodion process, which was time consuming and complicated. It was also quite dangerous as it involved highly toxic chemicals. The exposure time took up to 10 minutes. This inevitably resulted in her sitters moving slightly. This, combined with her controlled use of natural light, gave birth to her trademark soft focus style. While not directly implying Eastern, her highly individual style of artistry clearly benefited from her Indian experience. 
The richness and complexity of that country's art and culture certainly influenced both her work and worldview. Eastern artistic styles and designs were becoming both accessible and appealing to the West. For example, while the magnificent interior designs of William Morris came to be regarded as the epitome of Britishness, they were often inspired by the East. Unsurprisingly, Dimbala sported several different colours and designs of Morris wallpapers. During the 15 years they lived there, the Camerons were not well off. Notwithstanding, Julia's generosity remained legendary. But financial concerns had contributed to her idea of pursuing photography seriously in the first place. In spite of their beautiful home, the fact was their coffee plantations were not providing enough profit for them to live comfortably. Should they pack up and move back to Ceylon, life would be much cheaper there. But she was initially hesitant about making the momentous decision to leave Dimbala and head back out east. Understandably, as the step involved considerable personal sacrifice in many ways. But for her, family always came first. Still, in some ways a shame that she needed to leave the country just as her work was beginning to gain a degree of recognition. Dimbala functioned in a chaotic manner. It was usually full of extended family and waifs and strays, often doubling up as maids and models. Here are some of them with Julia in the centre, next to the postman. As great-niece Virginia Woolf was later to write of her, the colour of the clothes she wore, the glitter and hospitality of the household she ruled, reminded visitors of the East. End quote. Dimbala's cosy charm and Julia's eccentric and bohemian ways evidently impressed Virginia immensely. Much as she loved the Isle of Wight, in 1875 Julia finally made up her mind to trade one island for another. They famously took with them two coffins as packing cases. She knew that being reunited with his adored faraway island would improve her husband's rapidly fading health. But it was also their sons, all out in Ceylon, managing the coffee plantations, who they very much wanted to be reunited with. It was a big change, and they were removing themselves from Tennyson's Freshwater Circle, in which Julia had played such a major part. The circle was not so dissimilar to the one that would later surround the Indian poet Tagore. There are more than a few similarities between these two great national poets. Tagore would always revere Tennyson, but Julia must have missed the proximity and companionship of her illustrious friend and neighbour. She died in January 1879 in the recently demolished Glencairn bungalow in the Decoya Valley. Aged only 63, the bringing of the coffins proved prophetic. Glencairn was the home of her youngest son, Henry, who also became a photographer. It was a starry night and she had been gazing at the view from the window. Beautiful, was the last word she uttered. Charles followed her a year later. Dated January 1880, this is an original copy of an official document signed on the Dimbala estate by Henry acting as power of attorney for his father. Here, their shared mountainside grave. In the pretty Bogawantelawa churchyard, it belongs to the tiny but beautiful Anglican church of St Mary's. Inside, high up on the wall, near the altar rail, another family plaque this time to commemorate Charles and Julia. The Camerons made a financial contribution towards the three lovely stained glass windows we can see. Both in Sri Lanka and Calcutta, the photographer Julia Margaret Cameron is relatively unknown. However, she not only managed to break into the almost exclusively male preserve of serious photography, but to leave her indelible mark on it. Thank you for joining me on this somewhat shortened account of my trip with its many experiences and findings. These are just snippets, but I look forward to telling you more soon.